Lucy Letby is accused of the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others. While she was working on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, Letby denies all of the charges over the incidents. Lucy Letby was the only person working on the night shift. It was alleged in court that their mother was apparently told by Miss Letby, trust me, I'm a nurse. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations, the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven infants and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. In total, there are 22 charges, all of which she denies. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail, I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week on this podcast, we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. The case against Lucy Letby is that she murdered or tried to kill 17 babies while she was working as a neonatal nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England. She denies the charges. The babies in this trial are not being named for legal reasons, and the identities of their families are also being protected. They're known only as babies A to Q. Seven of the babies died. Ten survived. Each one of these babies was, or is, someone's son or daughter and the mums, dads and families of every baby are present in court, listening to every detail of how their child was allegedly killed or harmed. We'll be bringing you that detail as the jury is hearing it from the prosecution and defence. We're getting behind the headlines to explain far more than the news reports you'll be reading, watching and listening to. And the importance of a fair trial is paramount, so we won't be getting into anything in this podcast that the jury have not been told, because they are the 12 people who have to decide the outcome of this case. Today in this episode, we're focusing on the 11th baby in the case, the first of twin boys, who the prosecution say Lucy Letby tried to murder at pretty much the same time. Welcome to episode 17, Baby L. So, Liz, in the last episode, we outline what the prosecution say happened to baby Jay. Now, she was a baby girl who they say survived being smothered by Lucy Letby in November 2015. We're actually jumping five months ahead today to April 2016 to focus on two brothers, twin boys, who Lucy Letby is accused of attempting to murder. Yeah, that's right, Caroline. And the reason we're jumping ahead is the prosecution are not yet outlining what they say happened to baby Kay who is the next baby on the indictment. She was a very premature baby girl, who Lucy Letby allegedly tried to kill in February 2016. So that's exactly seven years ago. They'll be returning to baby Kay in the coming weeks, and the jury was only told the delay in hearing her case was for good reason. So the jury has been hearing instead about babies L and M who were allegedly attacked at around the same time during a day shift on April the 9th, 2016. We're going to split the episode in two so we can explain what the court was told happened to each baby. So this week we'll cover the evidence the jury have heard about Baby L and next week we will hear about his brother, Baby M. Well, Baby L was the eldest twin boy born seven weeks early by planned caesarean section at the Countess of Chester Hospital in April 2016. The boy's mother had a normal pregnancy until the end of March, when she started to feel poorly. She was admitted to hospital after a scan showed baby L was not growing properly. In a statement, her mother told the court about the run-up to the boy's birth. Her words have been voiced by an actor. It was a routine pregnancy and I had no health issues until March 2016 when I began to feel unwell and had to go for a scan. On that day, the doctors said to me and my husband that I was not well and needed to be admitted straight away. We were both surprised and shocked. I stayed for 15 or 17 days. They asked if I wanted a natural birth or a C-section. 
I asked the nurses when they were going to do the operation, and they said that they had looked through my file and were worried, so it'd be early the next morning at 9am. When I got to theatre, two nurses from the neonatal unit were also there, Lucy and Laura. Laura introduced herself and Lucy, and said they were there to take the babies into their care if they were poorly. The C-section was fine, and the boys were delivered. They were 33 weeks old and both weighed three pounds. The doctors said they were very healthy and very nice. They asked if I wanted a picture and put them in my arms and I had a picture taken. Her husband also gave police a statement about what he remembered about the birth. His words have also been voiced by an actor. My wife had a C-section. I was with her when they were born and got to see them straight away. The doctors said they were very healthy boys. They were taken to the neonatal unit by Lucy and Laura and my wife was taken to a ward upstairs. I was able to go down to the unit a couple of hours later. I can't remember who was looking after them when I went, but both were still fine in nursery one. So the boys were born and were considered to be in a good condition. And Liz, the court heard that Lucy Letby and another neonatal nurse called Laura Eagles were both present at the birth. And because the twins were small, they were immediately taken to the neonatal unit. And in fact, it was Lucy Letby who admitted them into the intensive care room around 20 minutes after they were born. But shortly afterwards, tests revealed that the levels of sugar in baby Elle's blood was low. Yes, and jurors were told that it's quite normal for small, premature babies to have problems with their blood sugar. They were also shown medical records written by Lucy Letby, which noted that she was asked to set up a drip of glucose, which is a type of sugar water medicine, to help boost the sugar in his blood an hour after his birth. And this is crucial, Liz, because it's one of these bags of glucose that the prosecution say Lucy let be poisoned with insulin. Yeah, that's right, Caroline. And we should point out here that insulin is a hormone or drug which is used to lower the amount of sugar in the blood. In other words, it does the opposite of a glucose drip. So Lucy Letby finished her day shift that evening and by then, jurors were told, the glucose drip appeared to be doing its job because baby Elle's blood sugar had normalised. Lucy Letby was not due to work the following day, which was a Saturday, but the court heard she volunteered to do an extra shift because the unit was busy. Yes, and jurors were told that a few days earlier, Lucy Letby had moved into a new house close to the hospital and in text to colleagues she said she had volunteered to work for the extra pennies. At the time, the neonatal unit also had some staffing issues and was pretty full, with 15 babies being cared for across the four nurseries. So Lucy Letby came into work on the following day at just before 7.30 in the morning. Now, this was April the 9th, and this was her fourth day shift in a row. Now, she wasn't the designated nurse for baby L. In fact, records show Nurse Mary Griffith was looking after him and his brother in nursery one. Lucy Letby had responsibility for two sick babies in the same room. And within hours, the jury was told, the sugar levels in baby Elle's blood began to fall dangerously low. Nurse Griffith asked a doctor, Tony Uko, to come and see him, and the doctor decided to up the amount and rate of glucose baby Elle was receiving via the drip. The jury was shown charts which showed Lucy Letby and Nurse Griffith co-signing for this medication, which is the rule for administering drugs to babies having neonatal care. And at around 12.30pm, the court heard Nurse Griffith went on a break. And less than half an hour later, at around 12.53pm, Lucy Letby began messaging her mother, Susan Letby, about the Grand National, the famous horse race which was due to be run later that day. The WhatsApps have been voiced by actors, and we'll also be sharing pictures of them on our Twitter feed, at Lucy Letby Trial. Is Dad betting on Grand National? If so, can he see which are greys and put a bet on for me, please? Kiss. Already gone. Doing Union East and Balakasy, which are greys and rule the world for take that. Two pound each way on each. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Lucy Letby's father, John, sent her the odds for the horses. And then, about 45 minutes later, at a quarter to two, Lucy Letby also started WhatsApping four friends on a group chat about a housewarming party she was planning. In the messages, which have been voiced by actors, she said, Sorry guys, mad busy four days in work. You can come to mine if you want to, just need to unpack first. 
Haven't got a spare bed yet though, so can't stay unfortunately. Looking forward to a catch-up. Kiss. Got Magnum Prosecco and vodka. Whoop. No disco ball, but sure we can manage. Kiss. Now, soon afterwards, Nurse Griffith came back from her break and continued to monitor the twins. She told the court that she was taking hourly heel prick blood tests from baby L. But even though he was being given extra glucose via the drip, the results showed the sugar in his blood falling even further. Nurse Griffiths was asked what she thought about the readings and told the court, With Prems you never know which way it's going to go, but it was quite a shock. I didn't expect it to have fallen. So at around half past three that afternoon, doctors decided to increase the amount of glucose being given to baby L even further. A larger sample of his blood was also taken and sent off to a lab in Liverpool for specialist testing. Now, Liz, this blood sample is central to the prosecution case, and I know we're going to come back and explain why later on in this episode. Yes, and in the meantime, the court heard, Nurse Griffith and Lucy Letby were in the middle of putting together a new bag of more concentrated glucose for baby L's drip when they were suddenly forced to stop what they were doing. This was because his brother's monitor alarm suddenly sounded. Baby M had collapsed and stopped breathing. We'll hear much more about what the prosecution say happened to baby M when we deal with his case next week. Yes, that's right, we will. But um, Nurse Griffith did tell jurors about her memories of the incident. Lucy Letby was with me, she said. Baby M's alarm went and she went to check him. She said, we need help over here. And Belinda Williamson was in the nursery and she said, you go and sort the other twin and I will make sure this is finished and goes up. She took over the care of baby L at that point. And you might remember back in episode eight when we outlined the case of baby F, who's the other baby boy Lucy Letby is accused of poisoning with insulin. Jurors were told then about the insulin and where it was stored on the unit. Yes, and again last week, Nurse Williamson reminded them that the drug was kept in a locked fridge on the unit. But she admitted stocks of the drug were not routinely checked and any of the registered nurses on the ward had access to the keys during their shift. Jurors have been shown a photograph of this fridge previously, so we'll share this on our Twitter feed, at Lucy Letby Trial. So after the sudden collapse of baby M, Lucy Letby went back to looking after her two babies, and just before half past five, her mother texted to tell her the good news, that her horse, Rule the World, had come in and she'd won £135 on the Grand National. Still planning her party, Lucy Letby texted a friend, Amy Turner. Again, the messages, which start with Lucy Letby, have been read by actors. Unpacking party sounds good to me, with my flavoured vodka, haha. Just won the Grand National, £135, horse emoji. Hey, hey, well done. Throughout the rest of the shift, Baby L's sugar levels continued to be monitored. But despite increases in the amount and rate of glucose he was being given via the drip, it remained persistently low, the jury was told. And it's the prosecution case that this was because, at some point during this shift, Lucy Letby injected insulin into his glucose drip to try to kill him. So Lucy Letby went home and had a few days off. And the following day, on April the 10th, another doctor who we can't name took over baby Elle's care. And it was this doctor whose presence in court last week caused a moment of drama in the trial, Liz. So what happened? So this doctor can't be named for legal reasons and he gave evidence from behind a screen. But as soon as he gave his name to the court, Lucy Letby became tearful and stood up from her seat. She appeared to try to leave the glass panel dock by the doors which leads to the cells. The trial judge, Mr Justice Goss, watched the drama unfold and asked Lucy Letby's solicitor to just see what the problem is. She had a hushed conversation with the dock officer and her solicitor before composing herself, although she did continue to wipe her eyes with a tissue as the doctor started to give his evidence. The jury was not given an explanation for her reaction, and the doctor was allowed to continue with his evidence. He explained why low blood sugar can be so dangerous for babies. Low glucose can cause illnesses, seizures and damage, he said. It can cause organ damage and brain injury. And during his shift, the jury heard, baby L's blood sugar finally returned to normal. 
and he was eventually discharged from hospital around a month later. So, Liz, we need to go back to that blood sample taken from baby L, which was sent to the lab in Liverpool to be tested. It was Dr John Gibbs who gave evidence in court about this blood sample. He said the results of the test were not received until April the 14th, which is five days after it was sent off. But when they arrived, Dr Gibbs said his more junior colleagues entered them into baby L's notes without realising their significance. That's right, Dr Gibbs said they were significant because the results showed it wasn't baby L's natural insulin, it was injected insulin that he had in his blood. Baby L had been given insulin he should not have been given, Dr Gibbs said. Dr Gibbs told the court baby L had not been prescribed insulin by anyone and that it would have been totally inappropriate and dangerous to give the drug, which, remember, is used to lower sugar in the blood, to any patient like baby L who already had very low blood sugar levels. And like in the case of baby F, back in episode 8, the nurses on duty, so that's Nurse Griffith, Nurse Williamson and Nurse Amy Davies, were all asked, on oath, whether they could possibly have administered insulin to baby L. No, they all replied. So that's what the prosecution say happened to baby L. Liz, the defence case is that Lucy Letby did not harm him. That's right, Caroline. Lucy Letby denies attempting to murder baby L. And we've not heard much yet from Ben Myers KC, Lucy Letby's barrister on this baby. We'll get more from him next week. But he has already suggested to at least one of the doctors who gave evidence that there was nothing surprising about such a preterm, low-weight baby like baby L having low blood sugar, as it is common in such neonates. Mr Myers has also previously said there was nothing in fact to show that Lucy Letby poisoned baby L with insulin and reiterated her position that she did not try to harm or kill baby L. So this week, Caroline, I'm delighted to say we've got a fantastic guest to talk about the criminal justice system and its portrayal in the media. Dr Ian Cummins is a senior lecturer in policing and social policy at the University of Salford. Thank you for coming on, Ian. It's great to have you. My pleasure. Thanks very much for the invitation. Can you take us back and remind us of some of those key moments of drama on the TV that have influenced how we might view policing today? In 1976, that marked the end of Dixon and Doc Green. It ran for 21 years and it was seen as representing British policing compared to other areas. So that kind of view of policing by consent, the police officer as represented in community values was all embodied in Jack Warner, who was a character actor. So his famous evening all catchphrase was this sort of capturing that view of police's community. It's interesting in a way that that drama became a kind of almost political reference point. So people would talk about, you know, this view of community. And you can see that now in the way in which people then go back and refer to why aren't the police more like they were. But that sort of idealised, if you like, nostalgic view did change, didn't it? You know, in the 70s, for example. In the 70s, I think you see clearly there were crises in the criminal justice system in the 70s in terms of what later turned out to be wrongful convictions and a whole series of cases. You see programmes like The Sweeney, which became hugely successful. John Thor and Dennis Waterman are TV icons, aren't they? The Sweeney is a much more brutal, violent programme from the villains and also the police. So, you know, violence seems to be a legitimate way to capture wrongs, etc., etc. And it's all based on this premise that actually the police knew who the bad guys were, but in some ways they were being restricted by the criminal justice system. Lefty liberals like me as a probation officer from really going and sorting people out. So I think from there, that leads to a kind of more critical view, because clearly there had always been people who, in criminology and other areas are very critical of the police. 
So you then see some critical dramas like Newman's Law and Order, which portrays corruption in the Met, and and you get, move on towards a more perhaps realistic drama. But throughout this, there's always been what you might see as nostalgic programmes of policing. So something like Heartbeat. I mean, Heartbeat was so, so popular. I mean, millions of people watched that programme, and I think still do. It's huge. I mean... Um, Is it still on? I think it's on those channels like Dave and, you know, UK Gold or, or whatever, but I think they're still it's still hugely popular. That's a nostalgic view of policing, but it's also a nostalgic view of the 60s. So there is something here about what people watch, why they want to watch it, and then how does that influence policy? And do you think, Ian, that drama can and does influence policy? So last week, Yvette Cooper was saying that essentially we need more Catherine Carwoods in the police. You know, we need one in every town kind of thing. When you've got a prominent MP, influential MP, making comments like that about fictional characters... I wonder whether the public do make those overlaps that are not always realistic. Uh, Well, I guess the point is that Yvette Cooper's made that overlap to start with. And clearly that's a rhetorical device, isn't it, to appeal to somebody who you know is very popular and can be seen as representing a a new approach. But, you know, it's not realistic. We can't base policies on, you know, people on the telly. And Ian, actually, the way that police work's portrayed in drama just isn't very realistic, is it? In dramas, it's much more of a puzzle, so that clues are left and you're meant to put them together to come to this conclusion. And, you know, there's a lot of police work which is... Well, mundane. Yeah. Scouring hours and hours of CCTV. When I spoke to the retired police officer, one of the points they made was that actually a lot of police work, like a lot of jobs, as you say, Liz, is mundane, it's routine. And it's boring. And I suppose just, you know, bringing it up to date with what we see now on TV, TV drama, true crime is it's all about high tech. It's all about DNA and forensics, isn't it? You can see that in some of the programmes like CSI, for example, there's this focus on forensic. Obviously, in CSI focus on forensic as though that solves everything. Obviously, at the moment, uh, there's a lot of focus in the media about the case of, of Nicola Bully which is understandable because a lot of the initial coverage was about asking for information if people had seen her. And in that respect, the public play a vital role. But this increasing sort of commentary around the police investigation and this assumption that some members of the public feel they know more than the police, when in fact, actually, we're probably not privy to a lot of the detail of this investigation. So do you think our interest and fascination in crime, whether that's fictional crime in a drama or true crime, almost turns people into sort of amateur sleuths. Armchair detectives, essentially. Because of rolling news, because of the high profile nature of the story, then people become invested, involved. You know, it's it's not surprising we talk about such a high profile case. I mean, I think there's clearly then there's a, another step where people go and try and conduct their own in, investigations. I'm not quite sure what they hope to achieve. Well, the point is that most people don't interact with police, with the court system, unless they call for jury service. So, you know, the only information they get about what happens in that situation is often off the telly. There's an American sociologist, Sonic, who described the criminal justice system as hidden. We all know about it, but actually our contact with it is very limited. I mean, I've I've worked as a police officer, so... I was going to say, I've been in prison. Well, I have. I've visited prisons. I've been in police stations. I've been in courts. That's like when we talked to Nazir Afzal about why courts should be potentially streaming cases because it would demystify the whole conversation around courts. But they're hugely important institutions. You know, people have a view. Just as a final point, Ian, from your role at the University of Salford, what is it your students come on your course to do? What is it they want to go and change in the world when they graduate? In terms of policing, the students are looking at uh, going into the police. Of course, they're doing equipment for that, but also working in the criminal justice system where they make a difference, I think. So they want to work with communities, work with local people, and I think they're very interested in the broader social issues that are often lie behind the sorts of cases we've been talking about. Really great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Ian. Okay, see you soon. 
So that's it for episode 17. A quick word just to say thank you for listening to us so far. In the last four weeks, the podcast has had 300,000 listens, which we're really chuffed about. Because it means this kind of journalism is important to you. So please do share and subscribe. Next week, we'll hear about Baby M, Baby L's twin brother, who Lucy Letby is also accused of attempting to murder. The jury are expected to hear how he collapsed suddenly and needed resuscitating after Lucy Letby allegedly injected air into his bloodstream. I'll be in court to listen to the evidence and you can read my daily reports in the mail and on Mail Plus. You can also follow us on Twitter at Lucy Letby Trial or send us an email at thetrialoflucyletby at gmail.com. See you then. Lucy Letby is accused of the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others. While she was working on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, Letby denies all of the charges over the incidents. Lucy Letby was the only person working on the night shift. It was alleged in court that their mother was apparently told by Miss Letby, trust me, I'm a nurse. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations, the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven infants and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. In total, there are 22 charges, all of which she denies. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail, I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week on this podcast, we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. The case against Lucy Letby is that she murdered or tried to kill 17 babies while she was working as a neonatal nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England. She denies the charges. The babies in this trial are not being named for legal reasons, and the identities of their families are also being protected. They're known only as babies A to Q. Seven of the babies died. Ten survived. Each one of these babies was or is someone's son or daughter and the mums, dads and families of every baby are present in court, listening to every detail of how their child was allegedly killed or harmed. We'll be bringing you that detail as the jury is hearing it from the prosecution and defence. We're getting behind the headlines to explain far more than the news reports you'll be reading, watching and listening to. And the importance of a fair trial is paramount, so we won't be getting into anything in this podcast that the jury have not been told, because they are the 12 people who have to decide the outcome of this case. The jury is hearing about each baby in turn. They've been told 11 babies were allegedly killed or harmed by Lucy Letby between June 2015 and April 2016. Today in this episode, we're focusing on the 12th baby in this case, the second of twin boys who the prosecution say Lucy Letby tried to murder by injecting air into his bloodstream. Welcome to episode 18, Baby M. So Liz, in the last episode, we outlined what the prosecution say happened to Baby L. Now, he was a premature twin boy who was allegedly poisoned with insulin by Lucy Letby. In this episode, we're going to focus on his twin brother, Baby M who Lucy Letby is also accused of trying to murder during the same shift on the 9th of April 2016 by injecting air into his bloodstream. We're also going to hear that a doctor had started to be suspicious of Lucy Letby ten months earlier. And we'll explain what happened at a meeting that took place at the hospital between staff who were worried that so many children were unexpectedly collapsing and dying on the neonatal unit. So a lot to pack into this episode, Liz, but let's start by outlining what the court heard about Baby M. Now, he was a minute younger than his brother, 
born seven weeks early by planned caesarean section at the Countess of Chester Hospital in April 2016. That's right, Caroline. Last week we heard evidence from the boy's mother about how she had a normal pregnancy for around seven months before she started to feel poorly and was admitted to hospital when a scan showed baby L was not growing properly. We heard how both boys were small, but in a good condition when they were delivered. Lucy Letby and another neonatal nurse called Laura Eagles were both present at their birth. Baby M was actually slightly heavier than his brother, weighing three pounds, 12 ounces. Jurors were told he needed a few rescue breaths of oxygen, but like his brother, was considered well when he was admitted to the neonatal unit around half past 10. Now Lucy Letby booked the twins into the neonatal unit and the jury were told little of note happened with baby M during this shift. Lucy let me finish work and was back at the hospital just before 7.30am the next morning because she'd volunteered to do an extra shift. Now, this was a Saturday and the day of the Aintree Grand National. That's right, and this was her fourth day shift in a row because the unit was busy. There was 15 babies being looked after across the four nurseries and at this time the unit also had some staffing issues. And Liz again, Lucy let me wasn't the twins' designated nurse. No, that was Nurse Mary Griffith. She was looking after both the twins in the intensive care nursery. Lucy Letby had two other babies, not involved in the case, in the same room. So during the morning and early afternoon of that day, the jury has heard, while baby L's blood sugar was proving to be an issue for Nurse Griffith and the doctors, his brother, baby M, was stable. Yes, nursing notes seen by the jury showed baby M vomited slightly at around 11am. And at about 3pm, Nurse Griffith drew out a little undigested milk from his tummy, which appeared to be bile-stained. His tummy also appeared to be a bit swollen, so the decision was taken to stop his milk feeds as a precaution and to put him on a drip of glucose or sugar medicine instead. But not long afterwards, baby M's condition took a serious turn for the worse when he collapsed and almost died. So, Liz, walk us through what happened. Around 3.45pm, Lucy let be co-signed with Nurse Griffith for a dose of intravenous antibiotics for baby M. Now, Caroline, while both nurses signed for the drugs, the notes are unclear about exactly who administered them. And digital records the court heard about suggest that Nurse Griffith was using the computer at the nurse's station around this time. And it's the prosecution case that while she was giving baby M this medicine, Lucy let be also injected air into the drip of glucose in an attempt to kill him. 15 minutes later, at exactly 4pm that day, baby M suddenly collapsed and stopped breathing and his monitor alarm went off. Lucy Letby was helping Nurse Griffith organise a new glucose strip for baby M's brother, baby L, when they heard it. Nurse Griffith, who was scrubbed up with gloves and a gown on, said Lucy Letby rushed over to see what was wrong. She quickly realised his heart rate had dropped and he wasn't breathing, so called for help. Now, within two minutes of baby M collapsing, Lucy Letby and Nurse Griffith began CPR. Dr Tony Uko, the registrar on duty, was already on the unit and went to help. And at four minutes past four, a crash call was put out for Dr Rabbi Jayram, the consultant on duty, to come urgently to the neonatal unit. A minute later, at five past four, baby M was given the first shot of adrenaline to try and restart his heart. But jurors were told there was little response, and five minutes later, he was given another shot of adrenaline. A third shot was administered at 4.12pm. Dr Uko also put a tube into his throat, so he could be put on a ventilator to help him with his breathing. Three minutes later, at quarter past four, Dr J Ram arrived. At this point, he said, baby M was still in cardiorespiratory arrest which meant his heart wasn't beating and he wasn't breathing. Four minutes later, at 4.19pm, the fourth dose of adrenaline was given. Still, baby M failed to respond. Fifth and sixth doses of adrenaline were given at 25 minutes past four and 4.30pm. So by this stage, Liz, the resuscitation attempts have been ongoing for almost half an hour. And Dr Jayram told jurors that they were about to give up when at 4.31pm, baby M suddenly and unexpectedly began to improve. His heart rate finally began to climb and he began gasping for breath. 
Dr Jayram's evidence to the court has been voiced by an actor. We'd reached a point where we thought we'd have to be withdrawing treatment. Thankfully, he suddenly recovered and his heart rate came up and he started breathing. We could stop CPR and the circulation became adequate again, which I was glad about, but I wasn't sure what we had done to suddenly make him better. I was pleased he'd recovered, but I couldn't really explain what had caused it and why he suddenly got better. Now, while all this was happening to baby M, his parents were present because a nurse had gone to get them from the maternity ward. In a statement, his mother told the court what happened. Her words have been voiced by an actor. About ten minutes after we left the boys, a nurse called Yvonne came running up. She said that we had to go back down. I asked why, and she said she would explain when we got there. The doctor was pressing baby M's chest. I was praying to my God to see my boy and help him. I was asking my God to save him. My husband was not saying anything, but he was crying and crying. Baby L was okay on the other side of the room. Lucy was there with Laura and a doctor. My mind was totally blank other than praying to my God. Then, it seemed after hours, they said I should go back to my room as baby M had stabilised. They couldn't give us any explanation as to why it had happened. Her husband also told jurors what he witnessed. The senior nurse came charging in, saying we need to come down now. We all rushed downstairs. I was down first as my wife was pushed in a wheelchair. I saw one of the doctors doing chest compressions on baby M. It was very distressing to see and I will never forget that image. I still have it in my mind. My wife arrived shortly afterwards. One of the nurses said baby M had been absolutely fine. She didn't know what had happened to him. They were working on baby M for half an hour and later told us that his heart had stopped. He then stabilised, came around and his colour started coming back. In court, Dr Jayram publicly praised his colleagues, saying babies who need half an hour of resuscitation often don't survive. The team that resuscitated him did a very, very good job. The very fact his circulation was restored was a credit to what they did. It is unusual in resuscitations that go on for as long as this to get a return of circulation. Dr J Ram also told jurors that during the resuscitation he spotted an unusual rash on baby M's chest and tummy. Now, we've heard about this rash before, haven't we, Liz? Yes, Dr J Ram recalled that while they were carrying out the CPR, baby M had a rash bright pink patches on his torso that flitted around and eventually vanished when he recovered. He said the discoloration was unusual and very similar to the rash he'd seen on another baby, baby A. He was a twin boy Lucy Letby is accused of murdering in June 2015. We covered his case back in episode three. But Dr Jayram explained to the court that he didn't realise the significance of the rash at the time. He said it wasn't until two months later at the end of June 2016, when consultants at the hospital decided to call a meeting to discuss what was going on at the unit, that the suggestion of air embolus, or an air bubble, entering the blood and blocking its movement to the heart was first mentioned. And this prompted Dr J Ram to begin researching the subject. He told the court that he felt a physical chill down his spine when he found a research paper on air embolus, because it described a rash in patients who had air in their blood that fitted with what they were seeing on his unit in Chester. I remember sitting on my sofa at home with the iPad, and I remember reading that description and the physical chill that went down my spine because it fitted with what we were seeing. But at the time of baby M's collapse, Dr J Ram had not noted it in the records, and in court he was asked about this by Ben Myers KC, Lucy Letby's barrister. Yes, he admitted to Mr Myers that he'd not made a note about the rash in baby M's medical records immediately after his collapse. And Mr Myers suggested that he hadn't made a note because the rash had not been there. But Dr J Ram disagreed. The following tense and at times chippy exchange between them in court begins with Dr J Ram. There were far more important things. The important thing was dealing with his cardiac arrest. I am going to suggest it would be incompetent to leave that out of the clinical note if you saw it. I disagree. In many ways, I wish I had written it down. At that time, I had no knowledge or suspicion that the discoloration could have been related to something else that could have caused cardiorespiratory arrest, which is probably why I didn't specifically put it in the notes. At the time, it was not the priority. I wish I had, and we would not be sitting here years later having this rather academic discussion. It's not academic. 
She is on trial here for multiple murders and attempted murders. Now, as we said, it was June 2016 when the consultants met to discuss what was happening on the unit. But the court heard that Lucy Letby had, in fact, been flagged up and was a focus of interest much earlier. Up to 12 months earlier, in fact, Liz, in June 2015. That's right, Caroline. Dr J Ram confirmed that his colleague, Dr Stephen Breary, who was in charge of the neonatal unit, had carried out an informal review into the death of another baby involved in the trial, Baby D, following her death in June 2015. She was a full-term baby girl who was admitted to the neonatal unit with an infection. We outlined her case in episode 6. Doctors and nurses who gave evidence about Baby D also described an unusual red or brown rash on her tummy and legs, which the prosecution say was caused when Lucy Letby injected air into her bloodstream and murdered her. Dr J Ram said it was not a formal review, but he and Dr Breary had discussed the findings. In court, Mr Myers questioned Dr J Ram about this. Their exchange begins with Mr Myers. He identified Lucy Letby as a person of interest. I think he noticed that Lucy Letby was the nurse looking after these babies, and that was it. He raised with you the fact that Lucy Letby was present on these occasions? Yes. With that in mind, she became the focus of interest as events unfolded. She had been flagged up as somehow linked in some way. There was an association with her being present, nothing more. You and Stephen Breary were already talking about Lucy Letby in June 2015, weren't you? In terms of association, but as clinicians we have to think about all possibilities. We don't generally consider unnatural causes or deliberate things. Nothing like that was being contemplated at that stage. It was simply an association. Miss Letby had been a person identified as a potential link by June 2015. Yes, and other colleagues had noticed the association as well. All eyes on Miss Letby then. Well, clearly, yes, because there is an association. So back to the night of Baby M's collapse, Liz. How did he do in the hours afterwards? The jury was told that within minutes, Baby M's colour returned. He made a steady recovery, and less than 11 hours after his near death, was well enough to be taken off the ventilator. By this time, Lucy Letby had finished her shift and gone home, and the following day, her colleague, Jennifer Jones Key, texted her to ask how she was settling into her new home. Now, you might remember we touched on this last week because Lucy Letby had just moved into her new house, two miles from the hospital. Their messages, which we'll share on our Twitter feed at Lucy Letby Trial, have been voiced by actors. Hi, how are you? You enjoying your new home? Kiss? Hey, I'm okay, thanks. Bit knackered after four hard days at work, though. House is good. Unpacking. How's you? Kiss. Yeah, heard you had done an extra. Not surprised you're knackered. Oh, that's good. Okay, Tar. Feeling a lot happier. Kiss. Not nice shifts. Oh, that's good to hear. Kiss. Nights, fry, sat, sun. My last for ages. Yvonne asked if I could do tonight, tomorrow day or tomorrow night, but need a day off, lol. Kiss. Yeah, no issue, haven't got many nights. Won't see you as I'm mainly nights. Yeah, you need a break, it's too much. Did come to say bye Thursday morning, but you were slightly busy. Kiss. Now, Liz, we need to go back to baby M's collapse because during his resuscitation, a note or a log was kept of the medication he was being given. Now, this is common practice so the doctors and nurses can keep track of what drugs have been administered. But in this case, it was written hastily on a paper towel. Yes, jurors were shown a picture of this log. The prosecution say it's significant because it was actually found at Lucy Letby's house. The court heard that police found the log along with a blood test report for Baby M, in a plastic supermarket carrier bag under Lucy Letby's bed when they searched her home, close to the hospital. She told detectives she must have forgotten to empty her pockets before leaving work and inadvertently taken the paper towel home. 
She said it may have been put to one side and forgotten about, but she denied keeping it as a reminder of an attack on baby M. The court also heard Lucy Letby had made a note of his collapse in her diary. She'd written extra and long day shift, plus twin two recess, under April the 9th. She told police she remembered baby M's collapse and must have written it down because it had been a significant event. She denied doing anything to harm him. Now, the court has also heard from the prosecution experts again. Both Dr Dowie Evans and Dr Sandy Bowen agreed baby M's sudden collapse was due to an air embolus. But in this case, Dr Evans said the air hadn't been injected directly into baby M's bloodstream, as we've previously heard. Instead, he said, it had been put into the port on his drip, which was used to administer drugs. The jury was shown a picture of this, which we'll share on our Twitter feed. As a result, the air trickled or was pushed into his system slowly at the same rate as the fluid in the drip, Dr Evans said. This, jurors heard, explained why Baby M did not instantly collapse and why Lucy Letby, who, remember, was helping Nurse Griffith draw up new medication for his brother, was not at his cot side when he stopped breathing at 4pm. Mr Meyer suggested that if enough air was injected into a baby to cause cardiac arrest, it would invariably kill them. And he said Dr Evans had no empirical evidence or experience to show that such air could disappear and vanish within 30 minutes, as apparently had happened with baby M. Dr Evans agreed there was no research, but said this was because it would be wholly unethical to carry out such experiments on babies. However, he insisted that while some children would die, in others the air could be pumped or dissipated into different blood vessels during robust CPR, like that carried out on baby M. This could also explain the pink rash or discoloration seen on baby M's body by Dr Jayram during the resuscitation, he said. And Mr Myers suggested that the decision to take baby M off milk feeds shortly before he collapsed suggested there was a potential problem and something not normal was going on. Dr Evans admitted it appeared baby M was having problems absorbing milk but said this was because he was premature and his digestive system had not got going properly. He said doctors had done the right thing and stopped his feeds as a precaution but he insisted this would not have caused such a serious collapse or cardiac arrest. Mr Myers also said to Dr Bowen that baby M could have had an underlying condition that doctors didn't know about that caused his collapse. But she disagreed and insisted there was nothing in his medical history or presentation to suggest this. Finally, Liz, the jury heard a little bit about the twins and how they're doing now. That's right, Caroline. Both made a full recovery and were eventually discharged at the beginning of May, around a month after birth. But a brain scan carried out on baby M around three weeks later was concerning. Sadly, that's right. Baby M had suffered permanent brain damage. He is now almost seven years old and his parents are happy with his development. But over time, he may not hit the same milestones or be able to keep up with children his own age. Lucy Letby denies harming baby M. So that's it for episode 18. Now, we just wanted to thank everyone again for listening and to give a special shout out, especially to everyone listening to us in Australia. Yeah, we know at least 70,000 of you on the other side of the world are listening to our podcast, which is amazing. So thanks again to everyone in Oz that's tuning in. Next week, we'll be jumping back in time a little bit to hear about baby Kay. She was a very premature baby girl who Lucy Letby is accused of trying to murder seven years ago in February 2016. The prosecution say Dr Jayram interrupted Lucy Letby tampering with baby Kay's breathing tube when she was trying to murder her. She was transferred to another hospital, but sadly she died three days later. Lucy Letby denies harming her. I'll be in court to listen to the evidence and you can read my daily reports in the mail and on Mail Plus. You can also follow us on Twitter at Lucy Letby Trial or send us an email at thetrialoflucyletby at gmail.com. See you then. <laughs>